Mr. President, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, this is the second time in fewer than four years that we have had the pleasure to host a head of state of Indonesia during a state visit with your predecessor having traveled here in late 2012. That fact alone, Mr. President, colleagues, speaks volumes for how much closer the ties between our two countries have become in recent times, and there is every reason to believe that this new relationship will become much more entrenched in the years which lie ahead. I think I can say, colleagues, without fear of contradiction to Mr. President, that your country, sir, is a fascinating country with a diversity both of geography and of peoples that is utterly extraordinary. The chance to learn more still through the time that you will spend in the United Kingdom with us is one which we should welcome. We already know, however, that Indonesia will loom large in the future of our planet. It will play a part that flows naturally from being the fourth most populous nation in the world. The economic links between us, which in truth were not especially significant in the past, the are government minister, Baroness Chorka, told Parliament that British aid was helping the poor of Indonesia. In fact, half of all aid to Indonesia is linked to trade, and much of that is tied to weapons. This is a list of British companies selling weapons or war-related equipment to the Indonesian dictatorship. In April 1993, shortly before the sale of Hawk aircraft was announced, the Foreign Secretary, Douglas Hurd, flew to Jakarta and gave Suharto £65 million in so-called soft loans. ...of what I would describe here today as the VIPs, Vietnam, Indonesia and the Philippines and the extent to which they will shape global economics and economies. Did it ever bother you personally that this British equipment was causing such mayhem and human suffering? No, not the slightest. Who was not born part of the political elite and who has not worn military uniforms as a means of assuming your position, you are in many ways the personification and the very, very, very welcome personification at that of a changing country in changing times. We are very pleased indeed that you are with us here today. The fact that I hope the nature and enthusiasm of your gathering makes it very clear. And on behalf of our parliament, I invite you now to address all of those assembled and eager to hear you. Parliamentary colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I know you'll want to join me in extending an extremely warm and, dare I say it, acclamatory welcome to Mr. President.
possible to develop a democracy and a modern economy that neither compromises people's security nor their ability to practice their religion. Indeed, far from endangering safety, prosperity and religious identity, it is democracy that helps to ensure them. And this has huge implications for others around the world seeking the same fundamental freedoms in places like Egypt, Iran and Syria. Indonesia's transformation is not just vital to its own future, prosperity and security. If Indonesia can succeed, it can lead the world in showing how democracy can offer an alternative to the dead-end choice of dictatorship or extremism. At the time after he became Prime Minister under the coalition, and at the time when he was dividing the nation between strivers and scroungers, I asked him a very important question about the windfall he received when he wrote off the mortgage of the premises in Notting Hill, and I said to him he didn't write off the mortgage of the one the taxpayers were helping to pay for at Oxford. I didn't receive a proper answer then. Maybe Dodgy Dave will answer it now. And by the way, order, 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 I, order, order. I must ask the honourable gentleman, order. I don't require any assistance from some junior minister. <laughs> An absurd proposition. I invite order. I invite the honourable gentleman to withdraw that adjective that he used a moment ago. He's perfectly order. He's perfectly capable of asking his question without using that word. It is up to him. But if he doesn't wish to withdraw it, I can't reasonably ask the prime minister to answer the question. All he has to do is withdraw that word and think of another. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I think he knows the word beginning with D and ending in Y that he inappropriately used. Davey. Davey or Davey. Withdraw. I know. I know what you think. Very simple. Withdraw. This man has done more to divide this nation than anybody else. He's looked after his own pocket. I still refer to him as dodgy day. Do what you like. Order, 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 order. I'm sorry, I must ask the honourable gentleman to withdraw the word. Very well. Under the power given to me by standing order number 43, I order the Honourable Member to withdraw immediately from the House for the remainder of this day's sitting.
Ladies and gentlemen, in Indonesia, we are now working hard to become a prosperous maritime, maritime nation. Country that upholds the universal values of humanity, pluralism, and tolerance. In 2005, three Indonesian Sunday school teachers were imprisoned for converting Muslim children to Christianity. Our CBN News Asia team recently visited the three women in prison and they discovered they're still sharing their faith behind bars. Gary Lane has that story. The CBN News team visited Rebecca, Ratna and Eti at the local prison in Indramayo, Indonesia and found them in high spirits. They remain positive even though they've now spent two years in jail for a crime that most people say they did not commit. In 2005, the three Sunday school teachers were put on trial after a group of Muslim radicals in their village accused them of converting their children to Christianity. Evidence was presented suggesting the Muslim parents were aware their children attended Sunday school with their Christian friends. Regardless, the court still pronounced the women guilty and sentenced them to three years in prison. A country that practices democracy and respect human rights. The series of massacres have haunted Indonesians for 51 years. Judges of the International People's Tribunal have concluded that the Indonesian military and former President Suharto should be held accountable for killing and torturing at least 400,000 people in 1965. Members of the Communist Party, their sympathizers and others at random were murdered after six generals were killed during a failed coup blamed on the Communists. The murdered Indonesians are buried in mass graves around the country. The People's Tribunal was formed last year after efforts to bring mass killers to justice had failed. Fight impunity, agreeing that impunity for past serious crimes against humanity poisons a society and breeds new violence. In response to the tribunal, the government organized a symposium in April where survivors and relatives of the victims were heard for the first time. But promises to investigate the thousands of mass graves have yet to be fulfilled. Half a century later and bodies in mass graves also here in East Java have never been exhumed. The mass killings of 1965 still divide the country until today. Recent efforts by the government to find some kind of closure have firmly been rejected by military leaders and right-wing groups. The international judges are calling on the government to apologize to all victims' families and survivors, investigate and prosecute all crimes against humanity, and ensure appropriate compensation and rehabilitation for the victims. We are planning to hand it over the uh, final report of the uh, IPT-65 to National Commission on uh, Human Rights, to uh, Attorney General uh, Office, and also uh, Coordinating Minister of Politics, uh, Law and Security. Uh, and if possible, we uh, intend to meet with uh, President uh, Jokowi to discuss about the follow-up of uh, this uh, verdict. <laughs> The Indonesian government says it respects the tribunal as a way to express opinions, but emphasizes that it has no legitimate mandate and is outside any legal process. Survivors and victims' families hope the verdict will put international pressure on the government to bring this dark chapter in Indonesian history to a close. A country where Islam and democracy go hand in hand. A country where moderation, 
tradition and modernity are bound by a common reference. It looks like a regular church service, but these worshippers are in an unusual place in unusual company. Several police officers protecting a group of Christians who are holding their weekly service on the sidewalk in Bogor. Despite a verdict from Indonesia's highest court, their church is still not being built. And that's because the Muslim majority in the neighborhood is against it. Now the mayor says he refuses to build a church on a street with an Islamic name. This is very stupid because there are many churches in Indonesia built in streets with Islamic names and mosques in streets with names of Christian heroes. So this is silly. This is dangerous for the unity of Indonesia. The mayor declined a request for an interview, but a group protesting against plans to build a church says the congregation has violated regulations for building a house of worship. First, they violated the law. Why does a church need to be built in a street with an Islamic name? And why do they want to build a church in an Islamic neighborhood? Will Christians accept a mosque in the middle? Christians who are forced to pray in the open air, they have quickly become a symbol of religious intolerance in Indonesia. Recent research has shown that a growing number of people in Muslim-majority Indonesia are refusing the building of a church in the neighborhood, a trend that is seriously worrying the many minorities in this country. The National Ombudsman has given the mayor two more weeks to implement the Supreme Court's decision and let the congregation build its church. If not, the president will have to decide how to end this deadlock.
Imagine that you suddenly found yourself in a situation in which you could secretly collect evidence of an ongoing mass atrocity, like genocide. If you did it, you'd be putting your life at great risk, but you'd have the opportunity to save hundreds of thousands of other lives. In 2014, I met someone who faced exactly this dilemma, but in real life. We can all do these things if we will only try. We have the tools at our disposal now through mobilizing people through social media and generating media, even traditional media attention with large audiences, to generate political competition. And this is what's required to drive change. For years, we've thought of stopping mass atrocities as the sole responsibility of governments. But that responsibility is fundamentally our own. And whether the world, the international community, will finally act to protect the millions of lives still at risk, under threat, by ongoing atrocities in Sudan, Syria, and elsewhere, will ultimately depend upon what we do. When our leaders turn a blind eye to atrocities, it's because we've already done so. Not only does the world's humanity depend upon what we do to generate political will, but our own humanity as individuals depends upon it as well. We are the very key to never again. Thank you.